Uh, so we just finished uh, earlier the verse that uh, related to relying on a spiritual teacher. Oh, So uh, now we are turning to the fifth verse. So what we have already uh, looked at this morning, we've... Uh, talked about making the decision, casting the resolve to practice the Dharma, and after having uh, arisen this attitude to uh, realize that without a teacher, without relying on a teacher, it won't be possible for us to really practice any Dharma, and so uh, therefore it is important that we do find a qualified teacher to, to rely on. <laughs> So after having investigated uh, our teacher and uh, found a teacher who is completely qualified, the next step is taking on some form of ethical discipline in accordance with one's capacity. So there are different kinds of um, ethical codes and precepts. There are the ethical uh, the the disciplines of uh, the ethical discipline of monastics and lay persons. There's the pratimoksha vows, the bodhisattva vows, tantric vows. So many different varieties and levels. Uh, as for the level or kind of ethical discipline that one takes on, um, it should be one that uh, we're able to accomplish and one that we feel able to uphold. Uh, by, um, by taking on some level of ethical discipline, only then are we able to um, stabilize our mind in meditation. And it's by um, uh, meditating well uh, that we will ultimately be able to realize the nature of our mind. Uh, there are some people who, due to a lack of uh, familiarity with the Buddhist teachings, think, think that there's no need for ethical discipline, uh, that there's no need for this. It's fine to start off immediately at a very high view. So 
However, when we start off with our practice, it's important that we don't do so in a one-sided manner um, from whichever direction we can gain, um, uh, can improve our practice, then we should cultivate these different areas and then um, proceed progress step by step. As for what we mean by ethical discipline, just putting it very simply, we can say it is um, not harming other beings. And not engaging in negative actions. This is also what we mean by ethical discipline. If you're wondering what the connection is between maintaining ethical discipline, discipline and achieving good results in one's meditation practice. Well, if we uh, do engage in conduct that harms others or negative kinds of behavior, this uh, creates or gives rise to regret and other negative emotional states. And once uh, we give rise to these negative emotions such as regret and unhappiness in our mind, then it becomes very difficult for us to abide in a state of calmness. When one um, sits in meditation, if one's done a lot of negative things, then during this time um, we'll find ourselves thinking about these things, these things coming to mind, and it will be very difficult for us to meditate in a state of calmness. So it's for this reason that, uh, uh, to begin with, we need to take on some level of commitment with respect to ethical discipline. So what this uh, verse is talking about uh, uh, is if we uh, don't take on um, ethical discipline, if we uh, do lots of things that are of harm to others, then uh, not only will we not have good results in our meditation, our practice will um, uh, not progress easily and uh, ultimately this will create obstacles for us achieving uh, liberation. So some degree of ethical discipline is um, essential. Even though some people might think, oh, matters of one's body and speech are rather minor, we can't afford to uh, cast away ethical discipline. It's important. So, is it the case that uh, simply taking on some form of ethical discipline is sufficient in itself? Um, no, it's not. After after taking some kind of ethical commitment, we there are many things that we need to do, and the first of these is study. <laughs> And 
And insofar as study is concerned, there's a, a sequence that we should follow. This is a threefold sequence, beginning with listening and then contemplating and then meditating and practicing. And uh, this sequence is very important. If we don't first study, then there's um, quite a lot of um, many dharmic principles that we just won't understand. Most of the time, our um, attention is uh, focused on understanding matters that relate directly to our lives. So it's important that we study, we learn about dharmic principles. So in terms of uh, coming into this life and then and then leaving it, um, we've had many um, past lives and um, we've been born, uh, we've come into cyclic existence and we've been spinning in this cycle from beginningless time. And the reason that this has taken place is because we have not known from the very beginning what samsara is. And uh, due to this lack of understanding, lack of understanding of dharmic principles, we are still here circling in samsara. The contents of the uh, Buddhist teachings are extremely deep and profound and there's a lot for us to listen and contemplate. The content is extensive. And the importance of listening to the teachings is something that the Buddha himself emphasized many times. Without studying the teachings, then we really won't know anything about Buddhism, the reasons why we should practice, how we should go about practicing. These are things that we just wouldn't otherwise know. So at the outset, when we are beginning to learn the uh, deep teachings uh, of, of Buddhism, it's uh, important that we listen to teachings by a lama. Of course, it's also okay if you read books by yourself. However, in terms of the really profound teachings, these are ones that we really need to listen to from a teacher. It's very difficult for an understanding to come simply through one's own efforts. Uh, some, sometimes we'll find in the teachings that um, there are things that uh, contradict or run in seeming conflict with the ways that we live our lives and normal ways of thinking. Uh, 
Uh, it's possible that um, just by um, at, the, at the beginning that one might think, oh, I, I have an understanding of these things, um, but due to not contemplating on them further, might um, um, disagree or even um, reject um, these kinds of things. So in addition to listening or hearing the teachings, it's really important that we think about them, we contemplate, we reflect on them. And uh, that is what uh, verse 7 on page 7 is addressing. So, um, as to uh, what kind of a figure was the Shakyamuni Buddha, um, what was the Dharma that he taught, what was the nature of the path that he set out for us, these are all things that we need to properly contemplate. So, um, uh, to begin with, one might, uh, one might give rise to doubts. Uh, is what the Buddha taught true? Is, uh, are things really as, um, he, as, as he claimed? And so it's important that we establish certainty in the Buddha's teachings. It's uh, extremely important that we resolve all doubts that we give rise to because if we aren't able to resolve them, then this will make practicing very difficult. So it's uh, after we uh, establish, uh, after contemplating that we can establish um, belief or confidence in the Buddha and then position ourselves as his followers. So it's only after we um, gain confidence that what the Buddha uh, taught was the unmistaken truth that we can then go ahead with our study of his teachings in a way that is free from doubt. <laughs> And in fact, it is uh, was often said, um, and by the Buddha too, that um, the uh, contents of the sutras and tantras um, should be given a great deal of thought by students. Uh, 
Oh, yes. Um, the sutra of Anan entering the womb, it is um, often emphasized. So um, uh, the Buddha uh, said this to Anan in this sutra. Then you can do some more is in a then you San Diego son it and you go with it and you can go then you can go then you San Diego need then you can go to San Diego then you can go then you can go San Diego or then you can go shit on go to San Diego and you said it's in your side or the not in your side is San Diego shot at the bottom not in your side then you in the and uh, as to what the Shakyamuni Buddhist actually said to Anan, well, first of all, he said, um, uh, you might think that um, uh, because I'm your relative, the Shakyamuni Buddha and Anan were relatives, you might think that um, because I'm your relative, what I say must be right. Then but he said you you shouldn't you shouldn't think like this. He then went on to say you might think that because I'm your teacher, I'm your guide, that you should uh, believe what I say. But again, you shouldn't think like this. And then he said, well, you might think because the Buddha was uh, very fine looking, very pleasing to the eye. And the Buddha said, don't um, believe me simply because of my external appearance. And what the Buddha uh, instructed Anand to do was to take himself to a quiet place and uh, give a uh, careful, conscientious thought to whether what he said was true or not. This is how he instructed Anan. So it's important when we hear the teachings that after this we really think about them a lot and um, uh, investigate their truth. After having thought about the teachings oneself and decided for oneself that they are true, after mm, gaining this knowledge, gaining this conviction, then this is of uh, great benefit to one's practice. So Buddhism in this regard is different to other religious traditions. According to uh, Buddhism, um, however many doubts and uh, questions that you give rise to is fine. It's, it's considered good. So the Buddhist teachings uh, consider um, giving rise to many queries and doubts and questions a very good thing. Uh, as to uh, whether or not one is uh, permitted to give rise to doubts, 
um, according to the Buddhist teachings, it is said at the beginning, um, doubts are good. So it said that at the beginning doubts are good, um, and then um, through and in questions, uh, then we can go about um, debate. Uh, but finally, it's important that we resolve these doubts. In uh, Tibetan monasteries, there's um, a great deal of uh, debate practice is uh, very, very prevalent. As to what um, monks debate on, the main thing that is being debated on is the Buddhist view. So it's by debating over and over on particular topics that um, students are able to clarify um, points that they previously might not have been, had a clear understanding of. Um, in uh, Western philosophy, I'm sure all of you know the uh, school of the skeptics. Uh, this is a school that encourages doubts and questions and not accepting things easily. So uh, this encouragement of uh, doubt that the um, is typical of the skeptics is similar to uh, the encouragement of questions and doubts at the beginning of one's study in the Buddhist tradition. However, there is a, a difference between these two approaches. Uh, what it said uh, in the Buddhist teachings is that at the beginning we uh, can and uh, should give rise to doubt. However, through our study, gradually we should eliminate these doubts um, such that ultimately we are in a situation with no doubt. <laughs> Uh, it's important that we do finally eradicate or eliminate our doubts. It's the same as with any um, activity that we might be doing. If we are indecisive, should I be doing this, should I not be doing this, then uh, we won't really come to anything. So it's important that ultimately we do address and resolve our doubts. So what it is, so it's taught that uh, whether it be the Buddhist view or on other issues, um, it doesn't matter how many doubts or questions you give rise to, giving rise to doubts and questions is very good. And 
However, ultimately, it is really important that these doubts are resolved. If we start off in the beginning with doubts and we continue to have doubts and at the end we still have doubts, uh, this won't be of much benefit or positive use to our practice. So it is important that um, uh, ultimately we arrive at a point when, where we have resolved our doubts, otherwise it will be um, difficult for us to progress with our study and practice. Ini nanti pun ada yang piti ni tawak korla de tontak mampu sekat hula susu otang boh yang boku, tni samlo mampu tane, tni susu latin desi de yang boh tni top sundi, tni tiang ngaco tni de soa nala tni pantau halipa mampu yang kores. So this uh, Buddhist approach with regards to the view of beginning by listening to a teaching, reflecting on it, and then giving rise to um, a conviction is something that has many benefits in our, um, in our everyday lives. Uh, most of the um, afflictions and suffering that we experience in our minds comes from problems or issues with our ways of thinking. If we can establish a, um, a good, effective way of thinking, then even though we might encounter difficulties in our lives um, through, uh, through having this um, useful, effective way of thinking at our disposal, um, we'll be able to uh, reduce or decrease the difficulties. Uh, As for uh, suffering that we experience uh, physically, then um, without um, meditating, it's rather difficult simply just uh, by thinking or by means of our of changing our thoughts to um, address this difficulty or pain. In Buddhism, we often talk about impermanence, saying that um, everything is, imp- is impermanent, is illusory. Um, we talk about this in respect of everything. Uh, once we've really established a, a strong uh, awareness of impermanence in our minds, this has a, a lot of benefits. When one uh, experiences physical illness or when something, uh, a sudden misfortune, for example, happens to a friend, by cultivating a really strong prior awareness of impermanence, when these things happen, uh, one is able to accept them easily, thinking, oh yes, well, things are impermanent. So this has benefits for us accepting such such things. And in any uh, situation, uh, being able to accept suffering enables us to be able to reduce suffering. 
ဒီမောင်းတင်ဒီယုံကြီးကပ်စီနာယောင်းဆောင်လောက်တာနဲ့အောင်တာငါတာတာငါတော့တင်ဒီဆိုပါကိုထိုလာတင်ဒီသမရ
uh, the most important, the essence is this meditation. And the reason that we say meditation is the essence of this um, threefold approach is that uh, we all have many negative emotions and thoughts in our minds. Everyone's the same in this regard. But in order to eliminate them, simply thinking about the teachings, investigating them, understanding them um, through hearing is not sufficient. Uh, usually there are a lot of people who say, well, I understand that in theory, I understand that in principle, I just can't put it into practice. And this is indeed true. Um, it may be the case that we um, understand something through having learned it or studied it, but putting it into practice, implementing it, is is quite a bit more difficult. So this is the very reason that we practice meditation. <laughs> As far as meditation is concerned, at the beginning, it can be quite difficult. And the reason that it's difficult at the beginning is because we usually experience a great deal of thought activity. And this is the same for every single person. At the beginning of meditation practice, there's usually a great deal of thought activity. Uh, thoughts of all kinds arise, including thoughts of a uh, negative kind. However, in this respect, we're all the same. This isn't just a problem of one or two people. Even though it is difficult in the beginning, if we're able to accept this difficulty and continue with our practice for a year or so, we'll find our meditation practice becoming uh, increasingly improving, becoming in, uh, increasingly effective. So in Tibet there was a lama named um Gumbodoji and he um was a lama who usually who was a practitioner, he was a full time uh, yogi. <laughs> And according to his biography, it was um, he meditated with a great deal of diligence and vigor, and within 21 days um, became enlightened. 
Tini tini kharang ka mantha ni tini gom jab ni tini ta gata dawa chik tini lak tini zi dawa chik lak tini zi kanang ni tini nam jin ni nan chua ka nang la yin na tini jamba ka tini no pa kang jiang me pa nyo mong ba te so ka kang mao no pa tini zi re song song ni tini song yore zi and uh, then it was said that by continuing for another month he um arrived at a state of of no afflictions whatsoever However, he was an exceptional, an exceptional practitioner. For the most of most of us, it doesn't happen like this. So we shouldn't think, oh, I've been practicing for 21 days and I'm not enlightened yet. We shouldn't think like this. Yeah. However, for really ordinary practitioners, and I mean really the most ordinary of ordinary practitioners, it is possible through one year of diligent meditation practice to achieve very, very good results. And so it's important that we train, that we exercise both our physical bodies and our minds. When we start off with some kind of physical um, training regime, then we usually discover in the first few days or in the first week that we feel pain all over, our arms hurt, our legs hurt. However, by persevering with the training, then um, gradually the pain disappears and uh, people achieve good results. Uh, in Tibet, there are people who um, prostrate for extremely long distances, distances of up to 2,000 kilometers all the way to Lhasa to um, make prayers in the Jowo uh, Temple. Uh, but in the beginning, they are uh, like us. It's, it's very difficult to do prostrations along the road, not to mention 2,000 kilometers, even one kilometer is quite difficult. However, by persevering with this for um, a month, the body becomes accustomed to it and, um, um, and the practice becomes easier. And after uh, people have become to um, accustomed to uh, long distance prostration like this, then it actually uh, strikes them as as very strange and unfamiliar um, to walk. In fact, when they try to walk, it's almost as if they don't know how to. And 
And then there are others who um, making um, pilgrimage or journeys to Lhasa. They uh, might not uh, prostrate their way, but they do so walking, carrying extremely heavy loads on their back, um, their supplies, their food, etc., things like this. Ini tambo, kapsa ini kerbau di mana cembo kerana rogo di te, sama ni macam la pena lewat ngaduk rogo na halipa kag dengu. Ah, di cuci ngaduk di. Lewat ngaduk la rogo na kag dengu. At the beginning, this is very difficult to um, just walk one day with such a heavy a heavy load on one's back. Walking for five or six kilometers like this is very difficult. Ini yang dawa kasi, ini drone, ini je ni, ini lipo la jantur top cawi jini. But after a few months of being of getting accustomed to uh, walking with a heavy load on their back and training their body um, um, in this way, then suddenly not to have a, um, a heavy load on one's back, not to be bent over when one's walking strikes these people as very strange. It's almost, again, as if they don't know how to walk. They don't know how to put one foot in front of the other if they haven't got a heavy load on their back. So there is, we can see from this, um, the, how it's possible to train the body. And it's exactly the same um, in respect of training our minds. For practitioners who uh, persist with uh, meditation for a period of year, um, er, they can arrive at a point where after a year, meditation ceases to be difficult and they are able to um, meditate well on um, whatever practice it's that, that they are doing. <laughs> The most important thing or the most um, the greatest hindrance for us all is the inability to accept difficulty or hardship. Once we are able to accept hardship, um, cultivate an attitude of willingness to take on hardship, then um, this enables us to um, achieve really great results. So it is um, it is said in the teachings um, uh, with in, in relation to meditation and the results of one's meditation practice that um, that this is not something that um, one has to wait many lifetimes to uh, for. It's not something that one needs to um, postpone to the future. Uh, it is very possible in this very lifetime to achieve good results in one's meditation practice. And it's also said uh, in relation to practice that in terms of in terms of one's practice, one needs to be self-driven, self-guided. This is work that one needs to do for oneself. 
Rangga mbak sun che na Dini chumji di su su rangga o ta ngarang dini tha sung samba Ngarang chumji yang pun dini zire sung samba Di di su su rangga nyam nyung gu tone Tama haku gu yore And because um, practice is uh, requires our own diligence, it is a self-driven, um, a self-driven uh, activity. Um, when we achieve, uh, we achieve results in our practice. These are things that we too can see, can verify for ourselves. Then, after that, then you go, then you swim, then you jump, then you turn, then you jump, then you turn, then you jump, then you turn, then you jump, then And with regards to training one's mind, it's possible to be um, extremely clear in regards to one's achievements, one's results. One can be very clear, oh, I've achieved this. One can be very clear that one hasn't achieved something. So in this lifetime, um, uh, depending on the amount of time that we invest in it, whether it be one month or six months, in any case, the um, more time we invest in it, the greater our results will be. Then <laughs> In uh, Tibet, there is a saying, um, a saying about meditation practitioners, and um, it says that for the really best meditators, they see progress in their practice on a daily basis. So progress every single day. Today, they're They can see that they've progressed um, from where they were yesterday. Tomorrow, they see they've progressed from where they were today. So they are really seeing themselves develop each day. Then, gum jam kan tinim jang jang rapot ini zina. Then, ni mari ri ri ri. Oh, tangaran dini dini yang song sambat yang gum mari ta. Ina dawa ri 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 ri. Cipzang cipzang tu korang zai. Oh, tangaran dawa ti nala. Tangaran dawa ngomat tili gang tu sambat. Um, and for average practitioners, they might not see uh, pra- progress every single day, but they do every month. So they see themselves this month have as having progressed beyond where they were last month. Things that they weren't able to do um, in meditation last month, they can this month. So their progress is something that they witness on a monthly basis. And even among the really worst practitioners, the most inferior practitioners, mm-hmm. there is no one who doesn't see progress at least on an annual basis. Um, <laughs> so even for inferior practitioners, they find themselves being able to um, achieve things this year that they couldn't achieve last year. <laughs> And this progress is something that um, practitioners can see very clearly from their own experience. So ultimately, finally, the most important thing is meditation. In 
if um, all we do is study the teachings, we learn a lot of uh, detailed knowledge, then uh, this really won't be of great benefit to us. Although we said before that clearly studying the teachings is of benefit, the benefit that it uh, brings us won't be of a deep nature. Ani, tanga so perna tambo kapsa tini nga so pechalatani perna jung tini pechalatani tini ta tina la kanji yo tini ta tini tina la yo pati so nga so shin tini shitari jini tini tina so jung tila nala yo pati tini jitin dala tini parandeshi jamni nga so jungu gumbata ta paratini jeshi jamni on the tini go re tini go mareze tambo kapsa tini chegre es. ポッドキャストティーチーズディチクテンダンドウチーズインカンポランゲアナソトミネクムナティニョジョンルクタンデリゼラチョコタトミネクムナガソジョンルクラティニソジョンチネーズティニョジョンルクナラティニヨパティオ
ハレパテニフトバテニシンケンモンボヨレジビジフトシンケンテニヨレジタンガソシロラペナナショラエナンデソナミツマラコンバモンボメティタンガソツリアンテニロジョンモンボチェチカボレトヤンテニニャムネモ
many Tibetan, Buddh uh, Tibetan Buddhist lamas visit uh, to give teachings, and they start off with extremely deep and profound um, training uh, methods such as Dogchen and Mahamudra. And so effectively, they are really starting at the very top and then working down rather than uh, working at, starting from the bottom and working up. It also seems that this phenomenon uh, exists in the West too. That is, um, people who haven't done the preliminary practices have no foundation to their practice whatsoever and start straight off with Dzogchen. It seems that this is quite prevalent in the West as well. Both in uh, the East and in the West, um, Dzogchen, teachings like Dzogchen and the Mahamudra, uh, a great many people really like these teachings. And that people like them is extremely good. However, if we don't follow um, a proper sequence and just um, hear the doctrine teaching straight off, then this really isn't any, of any benefit to us. And the reason for this is uh, in the Dzogchen teachings and the Mahamudra teachings, uh, they don't contain um, a, a great many uh, profuse and elaborate language. In fact, the terms that are used, the language that is used is very um, sparse and concise. Uh, the more profound the phenomena in question is, the more concise uh, the language becomes. <laughs> Uh, so it's um, important that when we hear these few words and uh, meditate on them, that we very quickly um, realize the nature of our mind. Mm. Oh, yeah. It's just like striking a match. If we, the first time we strike it, it uh, bursts into flame, then that's good, that's great. However, if we have to continually uh, strike the match against the side of the box time and time over, then uh, eventually the head of the match will break off. Oh, yeah. And if we hear the, uh, the first time we, we hear the, uh, the Dzogchen uh, teachings and meditate on them, we don't achieve realization and have to listen to them again and again and again, then eventually they become without flavor. And the reason that a match lights the first time that it's struck against the side of the box is because it is dry. Both it and the box are dry, and so for this reason it lights up. And 
If the matching question is a little bit damp, however, then not only will, is it impossible to light, but um, it will also it will uh, gradually it will easily fall apart. So at this present moment, all of us, as ordinary people, are rather wet. We're rather damp. We're like a damp match. Uh-huh. And it's through uh, doing the uh, preliminary practices by uh, gradually uh, completing these practices that we transform ourselves from a wet match to a dry match. And it's uh, just as uh, a match when it's in a perfectly dry condition and is struck against the side of the box, lights up immediately, so too it is with our practice. Once we have completed the uh, preliminary practices and uh, to a requisite level, then just a few words of the Dzogchen teachings will be enough for us to immediately um, gain realization. <laughs> So that's why it's really important that starting off where we are now, that we do so from the most basic level and then proceed step by step up from here. So just as I said this morning, it's really important with our Buddhist practice that we set for ourselves a long-term plan. If, however, um, without any foundation in the preliminary practices, uh, we listen to the Dzogchen teachings, then regardless of how good our intellectual understanding of these teachings may be, uh, they won't be of any benefit to us. Of course, our final goal uh, is to um, is to do the doctrine practices or to practice Mahamudra. This is essential as our uh, as our uh, final uh, goal of practice. Then also, that book that you choose in that, in that, you get going in that, be na yang ma in that, kab jidi in that, in that, dele jamba in that, kang in that, in that, mundo de la ha leba karchim bozigres. In Tibetan Buddhism, regardless of um, which school, whether it be the Nyingma or the Kaju or other schools, the preliminary practices are regarded as extremely important. And once we have, if we've established a, um, a proper foundation in these practices, then to uh, realize the nature of one's mind, this is something we can do Easily. And uh, there are lots of people who, um, uh, in their study of Buddhism, they um, seek teachings from lamas uh, all over the place. They, if a lama comes, they go to them to seek an empowerment. 
if uh, a llama is here, they go there. If a llama is there, they go there. Um, there are many people who who are, who practice like this. Um, by acting like this, it is really difficult to be to gain benefit. And in this situation, um, the uh, lamas can only give teachings in a really general way, in a really general sense. If they don't understand the personal situation of the student in question, um, because they are not their usual student, they are just there from time to time, then they don't have familiarity with the students in question. And so they can't give personal advice, and the way that they teach is, 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 is just a, a general kind of teaching. If when we are sick, we go and see just one doctor, then this doctor can gain a very thorough familiarity with our circumstances. Um, they can know how, how our, we were in the beginning, how we are now. Uh, they, can, uh, they, can, they can look after us in the future. In any case, uh, because they have such a good familiarity with our illness, they will be able to prescribe medicine effectively accordingly. If, however, we are not content to rely on just one doctor, but instead go seeking medicine from doctors all over the place, today one doctor, tomorrow a different doctor, here and there, then we may end up with lots of medicine, but as to how to take the medicine, um, how to treat ourselves with it, we really won't know. And so this will end up creating quite a lot of trouble. Mm-hmm. If a doctor doesn't have familiarity with your condition uh, because you haven't um, um, frequented them in the long term, just say one or two days with them and then moved on to another doctor for one or two days, then they, because they don't have a familiarity with your sickness, they don't have a deep understanding, the medicine that they prescribe you can only be of a very ordinary or general kind. Um, There are are some people who um, uh, 
uh, feel not contented, uh, relying on one lama, perhaps feeling, wondering about what they're being taught, thinking that perhaps I'm not receiving deep enough teachings, and for this reason go all over the place seeking teachings on the Dzogchen or Mahamudra, um, perhaps it's because they're, they're wondering, perhaps it's because they um, feel that they don't have much time left and they feel um, have some kind of fear. In any case, there are um, many people who, who, who do this. Generally speaking, uh, receiving empowerments from many different lamas or teachings from different lamas is, is fine, no problem with this. However, in terms of one's practice and especially the most important parts of one's practice, it's really the best if one can do this relying on one single teacher. And the reason for this is by relying on one teacher, that teacher is able to understand all of your situation. And they will probably uh, uh, understand what kind of practice it is that you need, what kind of practice will be of benefit to you. So in terms of our study of the teachings, to receive teachings from many lamas um, is no big problem. However, in terms of one's practice, it's really important that one uh, choose a really good teacher and then go before them and uh, receive instructions. This is something that uh, Lungjun uh, Ramjampa, for example, um, uh, recommended. So it's uh, really important that we um, understand that um, um, or accept that this is the way that things should be done and that this is the most beneficial uh, course of action. So in what we've covered today, we've um, really established a framework for Buddhist practice, beginning um, from the first time of entering into Buddhism. Um, uh, it's been set out the steps or stages that we need to follow. Even though this is very easy and straightforward stuff, for a practitioner of Buddhism, uh, knowing the path is extremely important. <laughs> So in having set out the structure for the path of practice, we've now arrived at the beginning for the um, for practice itself. But we are already at time for uh, this afternoon's teaching, so we will start off with that tomorrow morning. So we have uh, come to the end of our teaching for this afternoon and we are going to end with a dedication of merit. So 
So today in uh, coming and listening to this teaching and giving this teaching, this really has generated a very vast merit. So often when we think about attending teachings, we're really thinking where our thoughts are about learning things and studying things. We're not necessarily thinking about the merit that is, um, is generated through attending teachings. We usually think about merit in terms of doing recitations or doing meditation, but this really, really isn't the case. So um, we uh, should all end now with the um, with the aspiration or intention to share all of the merit that we have generated by listening to this teaching today with all beings. So when we um, um, make this wish to share all of our roots of uh, virtue with all living beings, uh, with the wish that they thereby achieve temporary happiness and wellness and ultimately achieve Buddhahood, when we make this wish really purely, then this is what we mean uh, by dedication. Glitz, page five on the book, let's or the handouts for dedication and aspiration prayers. Zambo, Jorge, Randall. 